it folly praise but fancy loves i praise and love love him life to leave him In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. By thy immaculate conception, O Mary, make my body pure and my soul holy. My mother, preserve me this night from mortal sin. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. By thy immaculate conception, O Mary, make my body pure and my soul holy. My mother, preserve me this night from mortal sin. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. By the Immaculate Conception, O Mary, make my body pure and my soul holy. My Mother, preserve me this night from mortal sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. 2021. In the Universal Calendar, we celebrate the Ember Saturday of Lent. And we also commemorate, today being the 27th, the feast of that great Passionist Saint, Saint Gabriel of Our Lady of Sorrows. From the Martyrology for today, the 27th day of February. At Alexandria, though he was so afflicted with gout that he could neither walk nor stand, he was taken before the judge with two servants, who carried him in a chair. One of these denied his faith, 
But the other, named Eunice, persevered with Julian in confessing Christ. Both were set on camels, led through the whole city, scourged, and then burned alive in the presence of all the people. And at Isola, in the province of Abruzzi, Saint Gabriel of the Sorrowful Virgin, confessor and cleric of the Passionist Congregation, having been known for his merits during his short life, and after death renowned for miracles, Pope Benedict XV enrolled him in the canon of the saints and in other places, many other holy martyrs, confessors, and virgins. And today being Saturday, we keep it in honor of the Blessed Virgin Mary, whereas tomorrow being Sunday, we keep the day in honor of all of our holy patron saints. Well, joyful greetings and best holy wishes once again to all of you who may be listening and I hope you are finding this Lent to be very fruitful and that you are growing in holiness and love for our Divine Redeemer and here at Papa Stronzi we've been very blessed to have a break in the winter weather to have a nice calm day bright and sunny and I'm actually looking forward to tonight hoping to see the moon come out tonight because we are now one moon away from or excuse me one full moon away from the full moon of the year the, the full moon before the great and holy feast of Easter the first notice for today is taken from the glories of Mary by our Holy Father St. Alphonsus. The first part on the Salve Regina Our Life, Our Sweetness, Section 3. Mary renders death sweet to her clients. Oh, how great are the sufferings of the dying. They suffer from remorse of conscience on account of past sins, from fear of the approaching judgment, and from the uncertainty of their eternal salvation. Then it is that hell arms itself and spares no efforts to gain the soul which is on the point of entering eternity. For it knows that only a short time remains in which to gain it, and that if it then loses it, it has lost it forever. The devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, knowing that he hath but a short time. The Apocalypse. And for this reason, the enemy of our salvation whose charge it was to tempt the soul during life, does not choose at death to be alone, but calls others to his assistance, according to the prophet Isaiah. Their houses shall be filled with, servant, with serpents. And indeed they are so, for when a person is at the point of death, the whole place in which he is, is filled with devils, who all unite to make him lose his soul. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The second notice is again taken from the Glories of Mary by our Holy Father, St. Alphonsus. From the second part, treating of 
the principal feasts of Our Lady, of Mary's Immaculate Conception. Mary was not only the mother, but the worthy mother of our Savior. She is called so by all the Holy Fathers. St. Bernard says, Thou alone wast found worthy to be chosen as the one in whose virginal womb the King of Kings should have his first abode. St. Thomas of Villanova says, Before she conceived, she was... She was, she was already fit to be the mother of God. The Holy Church herself attests that Mary merited to be the mother of Jesus Christ, saying, The Blessed Virgin, who merited to bear in her womb Christ our Lord. And St. Thomas Aquinas, explaining these words, says that the Blessed Virgin is said to have merited to bear the Lord of all. Not that she merited his incarnation, but that she merited, by the graces she had received, such a degree of purity and sanctity that she could become, be, should becomingly be the mother of God. That is to say, Mary could not merit the incarnation of the eternal word, but by divine grace she merited such a degree of perfection as to render her worthy to be the mother of a god. According to what St. Peter Damien also writes, her singular sanctity, the effect of grace, merited that she alone should be judged worthy to receive a god. And now, supposing that Mary was worthy to be the mother of God, what excellency and what perfection was there that did not become her? asks St. Thomas of Villanoa. The angelic doctor says that when God chooses anyone for a particular dignity, he renders him fit for it. Whence he adds that God, having chosen Mary for his mother, he also by his grace rendered her worthy of this highest of all dignities. The Blessed Virgin was divinely chosen to be the mother of God. And therefore, we cannot doubt that God had fitted her by his grace for this dignity. And we are assured of it by the angel. For thou hast found grace with God. Behold, thou shalt conceive, etc. And thence the saint argues that the Blessed Virgin never committed any actual sin, not even a venial one. Otherwise, he says, she would not have been a mother worthy of Jesus Christ. For the ignominy of the mother would also have been that of the son, for he would have had a sinner for his mother. And now if Mary, on account of a single venial sin, which does not deprive a soul of divine grace, would not have been a mother worthy of God, how much more unworthy would she have been had she contracted the guilt of original sin, which would have made her an enemy of God and a slave of the devil. And this reflection it was that made St. Augustine utter those memorable words that when speaking of Mary for the honor of our Lord, whom she merited to have for her son, he would not entertain even the question of sin in her. For we know, says he, that through him who it is evident was without sin, and whom she merited to conceive and bring forth, she received grace to conquer all sin. So I'd like to draw your attention to this point that St. Thomas Aquinas says, that when God chooses anyone for a particular dignity, he renders him fit for it. Notice first of all that it's when God chooses anyone. This is really important. If we were to take on a state of life or a dignity, 
that is not God's will for us, he will not provide us with the graces we need to carry that out well. But, and so it's really important, especially if we are discerning to take on a state of life, that we pray for the lights we need to uh, choose what what he what his will is for us but if we find out if we once we know or have reasonably reasonable knowledge that god is calling me to this it may be something that you'd be tempted to shrink from maybe something that you feel you're not capable of doing but he will give you the graces to be able to do that and he will fit you out for that state if you ask him to and we can see that he's done that here with our lady he chose her for the highest dignity that any human being could ever have and to be able to for her to be able to carry that out he fitted her with everything she needed and that's beautiful grace beautiful gift so after these notices we will have the holy rosary followed by the breastplate prayer of saint patrick and the exorcism of saint michael and the guardian angels, and then we'll have devotions following that. So one of the saints who's mentioned in the martyrology for yesterday, the 26th of February, was Saint Porphyry, confessor and bishop of Gaza in Palestine. So who was this holy bishop? St. Porphyry was originally from Thessalonica in Macedonia. He was from a rich and noble family, and at the age of 25, he left the world and went to Egypt and entered a monastery in the desert of Skeet. So he joined the Desert Fathers back when they were going strong. This would have been in the 300s. After five years of a rough and penitential life, he made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to visit the holy places. And after that, he spent several years in solitude near the River Jordan. Sickness eventually forced him to return to Jerusalem, though. But this did not stop him from continuing to visit the holy places in Jerusalem every day every day he was too weak to stand without a walking stick so staff in his hand he would drag himself to the holy sepulcher and all the other churches and oratories where that marked the places sanctified by the life and death of our divine redeemer when his disciple and future biographer Mark offered to assist him one day to climb the stairs leading up to one of these churches. He replied to him. St. Porphyry replied saying, It is not just that I who am come hither to beg pardon for my sins should, but should be eased by anyone. Rather let me undergo some labor and inconvenience that God, beholding it, may have compassion on me. And so, in this state, this state of deep sickness, St. Porphyry continued to faithfully keep up all of his exercises of devotion, persevering in these visits to the holy places, making frequent communions, and maintaining an unshakable confidence in God. The only thing that bothered him, in fact, was 
that he had left a fortune behind him in Thessalonica, which he now wanted to sell and distribute the goods to the poor. So he sent his disciple, Mark, off to Thessalonica to sell the property and bring the money back to Jerusalem, where he would then be able to give it out to the poor. When St. Mark came back, he found he could hardly recognize St. Porphyry, who had been restored to perfect health. So what happened? St. Porphyry tells us, 40 years ago, or excuse me, 40 days ago, being in extreme pain, I made a shift to reach Mount Calvary, where, fainting away, I fell into a kind of trance, or ecstasy, during which I seemed to see our Savior on the cross, and the good thief in the same condition near him. I said to Christ, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Same words as the good thief. Whereupon he ordered, me, ordered the thief to come to my assistance, who, raising me off the ground on which I lay, bade me go to Christ. I ran to him, and he, coming off the cross, said to me, Take this wood, meaning the cross, take this wood into thy custody. In obedience to him, methought I laid it on my shoulders and carried it some way. I awakened soon after and have been free from pain ever since, and without the least appearance of my ha ever having ailed anything. St. Porphyry. So having been restored to health, St. Porphyry was soon called to take up another cross, coming not directly from Christ, but through his representative, the Bishop of Jerusalem. Against his wish, the Bishop ordained St. Porphyry to the priesthood, and he entrusted him with the care of a very precious relic, the relic of the true cross. Three years later, though, he had to give it up and to take up another cross, the appointment of Bishop of Gaza. Our Divine Redeemer appeared to him at this time and told him this, give up the treasure of the cross which you have in custody, for I will marry you to a wife, poor indeed and despicable, but of great piety and virtue. Take care to adorn her well, for however contemptible she may appear, she is my sister. At Caesarea, the archbishop there consecrated St. Porphyry, Bishop of Gaza. Again, against his wish, he basically had to be dragged into the church to be able to do that. He met with a lot of opposition once he arrived in his Episcopal see because paganism was still very strong there. And before long, the pagans were blaming him for a terrible drought. So St. Porphyry led the Catholics out of the city on a penitential procession to ask for rain. But when they arrived back, they found that the pagans had locked the gates and wouldn't let them in. So St. Porphyry and the Catholic faithful redoubled their prayers, and for long, down came the rain. The gates were opened to them, and many of the pagans were converted, but not all of them. And those who remained started stirring up lots of trouble. So St. Porphyry decided to enlist the help of the emperor to get rid of paganism for good. When the emperor's representative arrived, St. Porphyry met him at the harbor, and they went in procession to the city. And as they were on this procession, 
they were passing by this famous oracle, the statue of Venus. But as they passed by it, down it came, crash, and smashed to pieces on its own. So shortly after that, the emperor's representative fell to work and under the guidance of St. Porphyry. And very soon, all of the pagan temples in the city were destroyed, along with all the idols and all the books of magic. St. Porphyry, assisted by the emperor, built a beautiful church on the spot where the chief temple had been, and he spent the rest of his life zealously fulfilling all the duties of his office in that city, where nearly all the remnants of paganism had been abolished. He died on 26th of February in the year of our Lord 420, and his biographer says of him, he is now in the paradise of delight, interceding with us, inter interceding for us with all the saints, by whose prayers may God have mercy on us. There's a lot that could be said in connection with St. Porphyry, but the point that most stands out is this. Semper idem always the same in sickness or in health in the face of opposition or with support saint porphyry persevered in all of his prayers in his do all of his duties and in his exercises of devotion and this reminds me of a, the question that was put to St. John Birchman's shows up in St. Alphonsus in the Glories of Mary. What is the best devotion to the Blessed Virgin? And the reply of St. John Birchman's, anything, no matter how small, as long as it is what? Constant. Constant. It is not how many devotions you start that matters. It is not whether you start well that matters. Perseverance is everything. Perseverance is the difference between salvation and damnation. And it is also the difference between mediocrity and sanctity. Perseverance. But this perseverance is only granted to those who ask for it. So you don't have to pile up lots of devotions. You don't necessarily have to drag yourself around visiting all the holy places in Jerusalem. But you have to pray, and especially pray the three Hail Marys. Every morning, every night. Persevere. Persevere in praying the three Hail Marys. Your salvation and sanctity may hang on whether you persevere in this one, not many, but one devotion. Even if you are not like Saint Porphyry, able to maintain all of the devotions that you start, make the effort to persevere in this one, because a child of Mary can never be lost. May our divine Redeemer and our Mother of Perpetual Succor bless you abundantly. The Holy Rosary will follow in a few minutes. Let folly praise that fancy loves. I praise and love that child whose heart no thought, whose tongue no word, whose hand no deed defiled. I praise him most. 
I love him best. Oh, praise and love is his. While him I love, in him I live and cannot live amiss. Love's sweetest mark, land's highest theme, man's most desired light. Joyful spring 